Well, it's time for a look back at what's happened in February in the Isle of Man. With me, a well-known chappy, Mark O'Connor, who's worked with us here at MTTV. Also, he's worked at Energy, Manx Radio. done quite a lot of the, the radio stations besides the three FM. I've done a few bits. few <laughs> bits. But uh, he's also our junior reporter. But I, I thought it's an ideal time to actually get a younger person's perspective. You're 17. You're head of school, aren't you? Head boy at St. Ninians. Yeah. Head Ninians. So... Um, with that comes responsibility and uh, you must have that that thing that the school recognizes you as somebody with uh, you know responsibility, responsibility. and leadership That's yeah what so what, what do you want to talk about what's taking your eye this month in well, february's been a very interesting month i think definitely but i think the budget was also quite an interesting one um you know you looked at alf's budget and it wasn't as glitzy maybe as ones in previous years but you know i think um you know you had a 3.3 percent increase in child benefit which i think was really interesting and really um, really good move forward. You also had the, uh, as I call it, you know, taking pot shots at potholes at the 1.1 million pounds <laughs> worth, which is good, you know, I passed my test uh, seven months ago, I'm an r blazer driver, and I've uh, started to realise some of the island roads are in a pretty poor condition. So, so it's good to see that the government is really recognising this need, you know, to save car suspension and wheels, really. <laughs> okay. Now you didn't mention anything there about paying for university fees, and that's out your not this thing is gone now, so you don't see that coming back, you know, government paying for that. Yeah, it was a couple of years ago, wasn't it, when obviously, uh, you know, Tim Crook obviously removed the funding entirely for universities, university fees, but then it obviously came back in, um, you know, moving on to, basically the way it works now is, I, I think, is um, each person p pays, so the government pays £2,500 per person, and then on top of that, I believe it is done on uh, household income. Okay. It's on top of that, but it's but you, you expect that. I mean, you haven't said, oh, should we bring back the, the free tuition fees like they were getting? Don't well, think I, I think I think the government is it's its role and its duty, you know, to really provide for its students. Um, but I suppose one of the things is, you know, there's very few people actually coming back into the Isle of Man to you know put that money back into the economy. What's your plans? When, when am I losing you? Are you, <laughs> are you going off to work at BBC or ITV oh, or whatever? No. Yeah, I mean myself probably going to be moving away from the Isle of Man. Oh. Um, it's definitely, from my perspective, I don't think the Isle of Man is a very diverse economy enough. Mm -hmm. The job market, especially in media, as, as you know yourself, is not very, there's, there's not a lot of jobs as such. But you've got great training, right? I've got, <laughs> well, only here at MTTV. <laughs> Would you get this amount of training? But Okay, but you, you think that a lot of people are still leaving Ireland? I think a lot of people are. I mean, my mates especially, you know, my peer group, a lot of people, I think more people are going into employment straight from A-levels, because a lot more employers are now looking just for A-levels as such to do the same job as a degree. But I think, for me personally, I definitely think to progress in my career, you know, in, in media, I think you really need to go okay. off island. Brilliant, thank you. What else is taking your uh, eye this month? Oh, this month, this month. I think also, you know, one of the big things, actually just uh, yesterday was the news mail, well, made instant into the public domain about the scoreboards and the future. Well, you're a scout. I, mean, I know you're not talking as an official or anything like that, but you're, you've, no, you've yeah. certainly seen the involvement. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been part of since I was probably 10 years old, you know, doing all, all the scoreboards there, and I love it. It is a highlight of my year doing the, the TT and the Festival of Motorcycling. But you commented on social media, didn't you, about this? What was your point? Well, I did. I mean, you know, I come from it kind of two perspectives. One, as a scout, as a member, but also kind of, I suppose, from the media and, you know, seeing how it is viewed by other people. And, you know, I'm all for tradition. And I think the scoreboards are an, oh, they are an integral part of the TT. And there is a role for the scouts at the TT races. But, you know, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not privy to all the information yeah. regarding the the internal aspect and also the structural, um, you know, assessment but of it. But it is, it is, you know. Has it had its day or you know, <sighs> privately speaking, just yourself, or do you think it should be electronic or should you think it should carry on? Or is it going to be a halfway house, do you think, somewhere in the Well, middle? you know, it's, you know, it's 2018 and I think the scoreboard really needs to, we need to look at the TT as a whole in many different aspects and how we can, you know, modernise it and make sure it's an event fit for motorsport. But specific, specifically to the scoreboard, I think there is definitely a role to play for having a scoreboard like it stands throughout the whole length of the um, grandstand. I think that's really something modern. It gives and something. It gives something to the TT. And and pictures must be video at some point, mustn't it? So we can, people in the grandstand will see what's going on around the course rather than waiting this well, yeah. 18, 17 minutes for them to come. I mean, definitely, you do see now a lot more people. They've got the phones. They've got the up-to-date live that's timings. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And you know, in all fairness, the scoreboard can't compete with the the speed of you know having because obviously the bikes have got the transponders going around mm. the course. So there's a lot more. To that, but I still think there is definitely a place for the scoreboard. And of course, ever since they had that big sort of 
safety fencing in front Fence. of it. It's never quite looked the same, has it? It's been an interesting one. Uh, you, also, you did a story on it a yeah. years ago yeah, when, it was, when it, it was yeah. first put in. Um, but that wasn't the scouts' decision. That was the that, ACU. That's the guys safety did. for you guys, though, wasn't it? I mean, that, in day, it is. Safety. And off the top of my head, the reason for it is because when the bikes actually come on the Glen Country Road, it's like, I think they sort of turn or bank almost to the to the right. So that's why it was put in. And I, I can understand, you know, at the end of the day, safety is the main priority always. For so they're making it to consultation. It's going to be like there's going to be such polarization on this, isn't there? These people who want tradition and the people who want it more than there is. I, I don't it's know how it's going to be. I don't know. Do you? It's been going on for a few years, hasn't it? I mean, I think um, Phil Gorn back in 2014 um, put out a thing about it as well. So it hasn't been on for quite a few years. And I think, I mean, I don't really know, but I, I, I know behind the scenes there's been lots of talks going on yeah. regarding, you know, the scoreboard and what's happening with it. But it does need whatever you think about the scoreboard. It does need renovation and, built and some work doing to it because a, okay. lot, a lot of them. I mean, if, you, if anybody walks past it, you can see a lot of the metal work is rusting away, and some yeah. of the electrics as well needs. We'll talk about renovation and modernisation. Uh, you, on your list, you had airport queues as well, didn't you? So I did. I you was, got a view on that. You've been stuck was, in it. Oh, jeez. I was uh, <laughs> careful. <laughs> I was on a Gatwick flight a couple of weeks ago, going off to. Um, I was going to Kent to look at. A, 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 I was going to look at a university of all things, and. Uh, I was, we were there plenty of time before the flight, probably about an hour, and uh, we're in the queue, uh, and then they, they did the final boarding call for the EasyJet flight, and there must have been about 40 people behind me who were in that flight, and they ended up having to sort of call them out, you know, going to the front of the Which then holds everybody else up as well. Yeah, also. and I mean, you kind of think to yourself, I, d I don't know any other airport that I've ever been to that is... And that it's, it's been fascinating that Travel Watch have come out saying they're handling this probably not the way that they would have handled it, you know, mm. it's, it's getting rid of the queues, not knocking down rooms to create bigger areas well, for the queues. I can see where they're coming from on this as well. Well, it's the thing, because they've got two sort of machines, haven't they? But yeah. they only ever use one in yeah. case they need to use the other one as a backup. Yeah. Um, but I think, was it £300,000 they've, you know, announced to invest in the effort, which is obviously, you know, it is the in and out of the Isle of Man. It's where all, I presume, all the business people come into. Mm. So you want to make it a good experience, obviously, you know, to benefit the economy in the long run, definitely. There's say. been criticism in the past that some places still in the airport look a bit shobby. Uh, the toilets, I always, I pointed out to Chief Minister in the past, <laughs> you know, this is the gateway, isn't it? And the place you leave, you, don't, you want everything to be as you nice wanna, as possible. You want to leave having a good image of the Isle of Man, and I'm sure most people do, you know, we've got great people here, lovely, you know, facilities, restaurants, hotels, and the rest of it. But it's just this sort of final bit, really, isn't it? You want to leave with a really good, lasting impression of the Isle of Man. <laughs> and, and we'll leave it there. And thanks for staying with us on the Isle of Man long enough to do the programme before he disappears to work somewhere else. But uh, one thing I would say also, just really quickly, yeah. is about the obviously the MLC elections. Oh, OK. Um, and I'll well, say that's obviously a massive thing as well this month. You know, 15 people now tendering, obviously, for the, uh, for, for the, for the jobs. And I think it's going to be a very interesting point. But a lot of people my age are really looking at the moment as um, not just MLC, but in house keys as well, is how you know, there's always been this impression of that, you know, it's it's an old boys club, House of Keys. And especially for a lot of young people, they don't, they still, some of them f still, still feel quite distanced, really, from politics in general. And it's, it's always going to be that case. Yeah. But it's, I'm, a, I'm sort of a rare one almost. That I always you take, take an interest in it. No school don't you? Say. I mean, at the MLC elections, do you think anyone really knows at school that it's happening almost? I mean, most of them are... I don't know what the age range is, but it's not obviously a, that young a, a range of people standing, is it? Do you think there's no yeah, one that's I mean, connecting with the younger people? There, there's always the odd person. I mean, the actual MLC themselves, obviously June Turner was the youngest ever, to my yep. knowledge, to ever go yeah, in. I think and, it was. and obviously in the house case with June Watson, also the youngest ever, mm -hmm. um, when they went in. So it still shows that there's not the younger demographic of the Isle of Man going into those sort of positions. But I, I think it's a wider question about, um, you know, do we need the revising chamber in the House of Keys? Now, I think we do. I think the MLC, and I think similarly in the UK, the House of Lords play such a really good role at looking at pieces of bills and legislation and scrutinising it and giving a different opinion to, you know, the um, elected representatives, obviously, in the House of Keys. I think it's, I think there is a future for, for LegCo, but... Do you see yourself taking a political future? I'm, I'm only 17. I know, but... <laughs> Be the youngest. Then. I don't know. It's um, it, I, I never say never. It. Never say never. I'll, I'll give a really good pol politician's answer now, and I won't say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs>